For those joining for the first time, my name is Ingrid Sheffer, President of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences. I would like to begin this evening's uh, ceremony by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the many lands upon which we meet, acknowledging that individuals are joining the broadcast from around Australia and indeed from around the world. The Indigenous people of Australia were the nation's first scientists. They remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs and knowledge. I pay respects to elders past and present. The Australian Academy of Health and uh, Medical Sciences is, is the nation's learned academy uh, and we comprise an independent interdisciplinary body of now 454 fellows elected by peers for their outstanding achievements. Since its formation in 2014, the Academy has had a strategic goal of nurturing future research leaders and celebrating excellence. Tonight's awards ceremony highlights some of the brightest scientific minds and provides an opportunity to reflect on their contributions to health and medical, medical science. Their achievements continue to transform healthcare, providing better outcomes for patients and uncovering new grounds in their respective research fields. I am delighted that tonight the Academy is partnering with CSL for the fourth year for the announcement of the CSL Centenary Fellowships. These prestigious awards are a hugely valuable contribution to Australia's health and medical research landscape. It's my pleasure now to hand over to CSL's Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Andrew Nash, who will lead us through these awards. Andrew. Thanks very much, Ingrid, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you to the Academy for allowing CSL to once again participate in your annual uh, conference. I'd like to acknowledge the presence online with us this afternoon of many fellows of the Academy, uh, members of CSL's R&D leadership team, and indeed, hopefully, existing CSL centenary fellows, including Jeff Faulkner, uh, Stephen Lane, Sarah Jane Dawson, Andrew Murphy, Connie Wong, Daniel Polizzi, Camilla Leithreimer, and Daniel Thomas, Seeming Mann, and Elisa uh, Glukova. Um, welcome to all of you. Um, now, as I think many of you will be aware, CSL established these centenary fellowships in our centenary year. We're around 107 years old now, and, and we established these uh, seven years ago, really as a way of formally paying tribute to our origins by supporting science, Australia's scientific community. Now, uh, having decided to base our early research here in Australia, the development and strength of the local R&D ecosystem is, is really of critical importance to us. And we look uh, for opportunities to really encourage the development of that ecosystem, starting with uh, you know, um, investment in STEM in primary and secondary schools, all the way through to supporting uh, mid-career researchers. Uh, we really hope that these fellowships will provide talented young scientists with the opportunity and in particular the resources to focus on discoveries that might be of great benefit to patients at some point in the future. Uh, we award two five-year $1.25 million fellowships each year uh, and the candidates must be uh, mid-career researchers less than 10 years uh, post-PhD and they must be Australian citizens or permanent residents and they must be intending to conduct the research um, uh, here in Australia at an Australian institute, institution. Um, we are absolutely delighted to su support this group of exceptionally bright young Australians, each hopefully with decades of research ahead of them. We hope that in the future they will count amongst Australia's preeminent scientists and we hope that they will lead and mentor a whole new generation of researchers at that stage of their career. With that said, it is now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Sharon Lewin, the Chair of our Selection Committee, and Sharon will announce the winners of the 2022 CSL Centenary Fellowship. So over to you, Sharon. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, it's a real delight to be here celebrating and supporting some of Australia's finest young medical researchers. This year, the quality of applications was very impressive and the decision always very difficult. Our first winner of the 
2022 CSL Centenary Fellowship is one of the inventors of the molecular clamp technology that can fast track vaccine development. And you all heard about this as part of the UQ coronavirus vaccine. The molecular clamp holds a virus spike protein. Everyone knows now what a spike protein is in its original form, which means it can generate an effective immune response in a vaccine. He will use his CSL fellowship to identify new antiviral antibodies and make them in the form of immunoglobulins and de deliver them to patients using mRNA. So it's the latest technologies being used to tackle infectious diseases. Our first winner is Professor Daniel Waterson from the University of Queensland. Viruses are the most basic form of life. Through understanding those, we're able to understand how life works at a fundamental level. And also we get to develop new therapies and vaccines that can save lives. And there's been a lot of advances in this field in the last couple of decades. I'm an inventor of the molecular clamp. It's a vaccine technology that can be applied to many different viruses. And because of that, we can make a vaccine very quickly to an emerging pathogen. 2020 was an intense year. It started with the outbreak and our team was rapidly mobilized to generate a new vaccine in time span never seen before. So what we've learned is developing vaccines isn't enough. What we need is new drugs, new therapies that are gonna be ready to treat frontline responders to emerging viruses, and that will serve as a buffer as new vaccines are developed. And we're taking a leaf out of how the human body responds to a new virus, where it creates antibodies that are broadly reactive and can actually prevent infection from a range of different viruses. We'll be able to repurpose the molecular clamp technology to identify weak points in the virus's armor and from that to mimic viral proteins, so like the spike protein on the surface of coronaviruses, so that they look very similar to what's on the surface of the virus. And because of that, the immune system responds in the way you want it to. The CSL Centenary Fellowship enables me to take a bigger picture look at how we can tackle viruses and will enable my team to develop new therapies against emerging viral pathogens before they're even able to become a pandemic. Thank you, Professor. Firstly, I'd like to thank CSL for creating this fellowship scheme. Support like this is essential for the future of Australian science. So thank you for belief, your belief in upcoming uh, Aussie scientists like me. Thank you for, to my partner, Laura. You've been along for the whole ride since my PhD days. I couldn't have done this without you. Thanks to my parents who may be watching online for inspiring me to do science and also encouraging me uh, to practice creativity, which I think is the most enjoyable part of being a scientist. Of course, a huge thanks to my lab team, all the amazing students past and present and the talented research team. This award is a reflection of the sum of our efforts together. I'd particularly like to thank my lab manager, Stacey, who without the lab would probably fall apart, and the PAC, who inspires me daily with a love for science and pursuing new questions. I'd like to thank my mentors and colleagues, Paul and Keith, co-inventors of the molecular clamp, Jody and Roy, and the whole team who built the Chimera technology. It's been a great pleasure to be part of the strong virology team here at the School of Chemistry and Molecular Biosciences at UQ. Big thanks to the continued support from Trent Munro at the National Biologics Facility and, and Patrick Redding at the Doherty. Roger Webb at the CMM team at UQ who enable us to look deeper into how, how viral antigens work at the molecular level. Finally, I'd like to thank our funders who have supported me and our team along the way, including the University of Queensland, the NHMRC, the MRFF, and of course, CEPI. Thanks to their support, my team has been able to keep progressing towards a better understanding of how viruses work and how we can use our immune system to fight back. Thank you, Daniel. Congratulations and again, and as a virologist, I'm really looking forward to following your research over the next five years, as I have done over the last five years. Our second winner of the 2022 CSL Centenary Fellow is investigating the function of the enzyme RNA polymerase II. When this molecular machine makes mistakes in transcribing DNA into mRNA, the consequences in humans can be profound and include the development of poor prognosis cancers such as acute myeloid leukemia. He will use his CSL Centenary Fellowship 
to unravel the inner workings of RNA polymerase II and what goes wrong leading to cancer. He anticipates that this will allow him to identify possible small molecule drugs that could target AML and other cancers. Our second winner is Dr. Stefan Vervoot from Wehi and the Peter McCallum Cancer Center in Melbourne. If you imagine whenever you want to send a message on your phone, for example, if that message arrives with the wrong person or it arrives way too late, then of course this would cause havoc for your personal life. And in the same way, cancer cells have this sort of dysregulation when the wrong message arrives at the wrong place and the wrong time. And that fuels an aggressive growth of the cancer cells. And that's what my research aims to understand. I believe there's a lot to be learned still about how genes are regulated. In the old days, we believed that it was sort of a binary switch, on, off, and now we understand that there's a multi-layered regulatory network that controls when and where genes should be activated, and that's critical for normal development and when dysregulated results in disease. I study the cell's messenger factory that generates the message from the DNA. So it transcribes a gene into a message, and that message instructs how the cells should behave and respond to cellular cues, so the environment, for example. What we've also come to realize is that recurrent mutations in the key components that regulate this machine are the causal factor for many blood cancers, in particular acute myeloid leukemias, and they drive aggressive properties and they also confer therapy resistance, so to conventional therapies. I really want to understand how the cell's messenger factory works in a comprehensive manner. Then I want to understand how they are dysregulated in cancer. And finally, I want to find out which components we should be targeting in the context of cancer therapies. The CSL Centenary Fellowship gives me the five year of support and security to really pursue a bold, innovative research plan and allows me to attract top talent from around the world and within Australia to make my research plan a reality. Uh, hello everyone. Um, I'd just like to say that I'm incredibly grateful and excited to be one of this year's CSL Centenary Fellows. And I'm honored to be part of the great list of scientists that have previously won this uh, award. I came here just under six years ago and now it will really make me a permanent member of the Australian research community. Um, I would like to thank CSL primarily and the Scientific Evaluation Committee and look forward to meeting everyone in person after once it's possible again. Um, I'm extremely excited about the uh, basic and translational scientific discoveries this unique fellowship enables at this important point in my career where I start my own lab. Um, I would really like to thank the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute and in particular professors Anna Voss and Marnie Blewett for giving me the opportunities to start my own research lab there at the beginning of next year. Um, I would also like to thank the Peter McCallum Cancer Center and in particular Professor Ricky Johnston for his amazing support that I've received in the last five years in his lab as a postdoctoral research fellow. In addition, I'd like to thank Associate Professor Edwin Hawkins from WEHI for his mentorship over the last 10 years. And I would also like to thank my key collaborator, Professor Nathaniel Bray from Stanford University, um, who acted as my referee. Um, in addition to that, I would like to thank the Netherlands Scientific Organization and NHMRC who have previously supported me with um, fellowships. Uh, finally, I would like to thank my family, who I haven't seen in a while, and in particular my partner Natalia uh, for all their support during these times. Um, and thanks again for everyone, um, to everyone at CSL. I could not be more grateful and happy to be the recipient of this uh, prestigious award. Thanks so much, Stefan, and warmest congratulations to you and to Daniel Watterson on being the two CSL Centenary Fellowship recipients, a wonderful accolade. It's now my pleasure to introduce the next part of our proceedings, the awarding of the Junzo Medal winners. The Junzo Medal was the Academy's first honorific award made annually to rising stars in translational health and biomedical science. Recipients must be within 15 years of completing their PhD and making a significant impact 
in translational medical science and primarily working in Australia. The medal is named in recognition of Dr. Jian Zhou, a molecular biologist and virologist who worked with Professor Ian Fraser to develop and patient the technology underpinning the Gardasil vaccine, which protects against viruses that cause cervical cancer. The medal was launched in 2019 and made possible by a generous donation from the Fraser Family Foundation. And I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Ian and Caroline Fraser of the Fraser Family Foundation. I'm delighted now to introduce Professor Ian Fraser to say a few words about the medal and Dr. Jian Zhou. And just by introduction, I'm sure Ian doesn't really need one, but he's a professor at the University of Queensland and he leads a research group working at the Translational Research Institute in Brisbane on the immunobiology of epithelial ca cancers. Ian was the inaugural president of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences, and he led the Academy's formation until he stepped down from that role in October 2019. Ian continues to be extremely busy and have many roles, including on the boards of several companies and not-for-profit organisations. I'll hand over now to Ian. Ingrid, thank you very much for that introduction and for the uh, background to the Zhu Medal. Dr. Zhu was an outstanding young biomedical science scientist. We met in Cambridge in 1990 and worked together in Cambridge and then in Brisbane in 1991 to develop the technology enabling the HPV vaccine now used worldwide to help prevent cervical cancer. Unfortunately, Jan was taken from us prematurely by illness in 1998. I acknowledge today the presence online of his wife, Chao Yi-san, and his son, Andreas. I was really delighted when the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences agreed to honour Jan's name and his contribution to medical research by creating a Jan Zhu Medal to be given annually to young scientists who have made outstanding contributions to biomedical science in Australia. This year, the award committee was extremely impressed by the quality of the applicants put forward for the award and were allowed to recommend not one, but two worthy young scientists to receive the award. I can now announce that the first awardee is Professor Shireen Loy from the Peter McCallum Research Institute in Melbourne. The last decade, cancer immunotherapy has dramatically changed cancer treatment for most patients. This type of therapy actually uses the patient's immune system to fight the cancer, where traditionally we've always targeted the tumour. Traditionally, breast cancer has not been thought to be amenable to immune therapy. This is because the risk factors for developing breast cancer are largely hormonal, so related to menarche, number of children, breastfeeding, etc. However, my research has shown that breast cancers contain a large amount of immune cells, and these cells are important in determining a patient's outcome from breast cancer. The good news is for patients, we conducted some of the first trials of immunotherapy for breast cancer at Peter Mac, and also I was responsible for the first trial in the world of immunotherapy for a certain type of breast cancer that expresses the HER2 oncogene, which will hopefully mean that all breast cancer patients can access these therapies in the near future. The first patient we treated had a great response and she remained in complete remission from her advanced breast cancer, so usually a terminal condition, for three to four years. So that was a really promising first sign that the immunotherapy treatment was working in breast cancer patients. I'm very honoured that my work has been recognised for its importance for the wider medical community and for cancer research. Obviously, we're hoping for the cure and to get rid of some of the particularly nasty types of breast cancer that affect young women. And we strongly believe that immunotherapy will result in that. So this is what we're working towards. Congratulations, Shireen, on your significant contribution to the field of cancer immunotherapy, an area of research very close to my heart, and on your award of the medal today. I get allowed to ask you a couple of questions. So I start off firstly by asking, what does the award of the Janzu Medal mean to you? Thank you, Professor Fraser. 
Well, I'm very honoured and grateful to have my research recognised and to be awarded the Jean Jou Medal by the Academy for 2021. Of course, in accepting this honour, I'd like to thank the Academy, yourself, the Fraser Family Foundation, and I'd like to thank Jiang Zhu's widow and research partner, Dr. Sun, and their son, Andreas, for attending today. Of course, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work of my team and lab at Peter Mac because it does take a village. I'd like to thank the executive at Peter Mac and my many collaborators at Peter Mac nationally and internationally, whom I worked with over the years. I'd really like to shout out to Roberto Salgado, who's my pathologist partner in crime. And I'd like to acknowledge the National Breast Cancer Foundation of Australia for their continued support. And of course, I'd like to thank my family. So thank you. So the second question that I might have for you is, what would be the next goal for your research in breast cancer? Well, obviously we're working towards the cure and I strongly believe immunotherapy can bring us there. My work is focusing on defining the best immunotherapy combinations for patients and working really hard to bring them to the clinic and show that they're effective. So that's what I'm working on at the moment, just a tiny thing. <laughs> Oh, it's no challenge in that. Uh, look, th thank you very much, Shireen. And once again, congratulations on the award that you fully deserve. I'll now hand back to Professor Ingrid Sheffer. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. And my warmest congratulations to you, Shireen. That's fantastic. I'm now delighted to announce our second Junzo Medal winner. And this is a, a, the successful candidate is a participant in the Academy's mentorship program, Professor D. Yu. I have been studying T cells for almost 20 years. And T cell is not just a one identity. T cell have multiple subgroups with different type of function. And we have discovered the T cell special functional group can control a variety of immune function and response ranging from allergic disease, autoimmune disease, infectious disease, and also cancer immunotherapy or vaccinations. So it is very exciting. I'm in this environment. I can talk with clinicians and we can work in together to design new human clinical study or clinical trials. Through these very strong collaborations, we were able to translate my basic research into a new therapy for patients with lupus. We were able to repurpose a drug initially designed to treat cancer, now to treat lupus. And based on the different dose or based on different regulation of T cells can either enhance immunity or suppress immunity. That's amazing. We also discover a new way potentially can cure the HIV patient. And we also try to improve the vaccine response. Hopefully that will help us to end the pandemic. I'm very proud to win the Gendro Medal. And we know Gendro, working with Professor Ian Fraser, developed this new technology which allow the success of the development for the HPV vaccine. So this is a big encouragement and aligns so well with the ultimate goal of my research, from basic research to translation in medicine. Professor Yu, congratulations. Uh, this is a wonderful accomplishment. Can you tell us, I understand that Jianzo was an, an inspiration for you. Tell us what does winning this medal mean for you? Thank you, Ingrid. And the uh, uh, Jianzo medal was announced this year in the same day of my birthday, uh, which I turned 42 years old. And uh, coincidentally, and Dr. Zhou unfortunately passed away at the very young age, also 42 years old. Yeah. Um, so I really thank uh, the Academy and Fraser Foundation and the general's uh, wife, Xiaoyi, I met before, and uh, uh, all my team and uh, my collaborator of the years, which 
come to uh, this medal. Um, I think the Jinjo medal is an inspiration for me, an inspiration of making breakthrough in human disease and therapy by fundamental biomedical research. Um, Dr. Zhou, uh, despite being initially training for clinical medicine, um, became passionate on biomedical research. So he worked as a molecular biologist and biologist rather than practicing. Myself was trained as a biologist and immunologist. And even though I have been working on human disease, but mostly on the science part of that. So I'm a little bit different from um, Professor Loy and uh, the last year's general medalist, um, Professor Dawson and uh, Professor Steen, who are all uh, physician scientists and they are practicing. So I think the general medal to me, a uh, biomedical scientist and uh, all the others, uh, physician scientists really highlights both basic and clinical research can lead to the breakthrough in improving health and well-being. Thank you. I think, I think Dr. Zhou would be just so excited to see that you're the, one of the recipients of his medal. And I think he'd be totally thrilled to see such a, um, a high-flying scientist. Tell us, what is your next goal in immunology? Thank you for your very kind of words. And I hope he will, and I'm sure he was thinking the same way. Um, my next goal in immunology is to develop systems immunology approaches for precision immunotherapy. As you mentioned, I attended a, a workshop yesterday, which is about communicating science to a lay audience. So let's rephrase what I'm just saying in a different way. So my goal is to understand the major difference of the immune system in individuals so that we can precisely control our immunity to treat a disease, in particular cancer. Um, I think most of the immune intervention, including vaccine or immunotherapies, uh, uh, such as autoimmune disease for cancer immunotherapy, has not been tailored for individuals. On the other hand, uh, these immunotherapies um, broadly turn up or down our immune system without specificity for auto antigen in autoimmune disease or tumor antigen in cancer. So that's why I initiate systems immunology a special interest group uh, at uh, Australia and the New Zealand Society for Immunology to bring together basic and clinical immunologists to address this major limitation. So hopefully in not uh, too long in the future, we can apply systems immunology to better understand individual's immune system so that we can treat patient in a precision way, maximizing uh, the efficacy and uh, minimizing the side effects. That's my goal and the dream. Thank you. Thank you, Dee, and uh, congratulations. A very important area that you're working in. And I think it's wonderful to see the fruits of the mentorship workshop yesterday when we talked about science communication and you just described that beautifully. So thank you and, and congratulations. I'd like to move on now to introduce our inaugural Outstanding Female Researcher Medal. And this is the Academy's second honorific award, which was established in 2020 and is being awarded for the first time tonight. The new medal, the Academy Medal for Outstanding Female Researcher is awarded annually to a woman with one or more seminal discoveries in the health and medical sciences, primarily working in Australia. Not only does it recognize the incredible achievements of female researchers, it also celebrates role models for women in health and medicine, many of whom have encountered additional barriers to success compared with their male counterparts. The Academy is committed to promoting diversity and inclusion in science. We acknowledge that this is an issue in society and we are grateful that the creation of this new award has been initiated by Professor Simon Gandivia through a generous donation from the Gandivia Foundation.
I'm now pleased to introduce Professor Simon Gandivia, who will announce the recipient of the award. But just a quick description about Simon's background, which is as a clinical neurophysiologist, and he co-founded Neuroscience Research Australia in Sydney, and he is the deputy director. He has made major discoveries about human movement control in health and disease, and his work has generated new techniques and provided insight into disorders such as stroke, spinal cord injury, polio, asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and obstructive sleep apnea, to name but a few. He currently heads a broad program on pathophysiology of motor impairments. Simon. Uh, President, members of the Academy, award and medal winners. First, I too pledge my respect to the First Nation owners of our country and to their diverse cultures and elders. It's a special pleasure to introduce this inaugural medal for outstanding female researcher. The origin of the medal, uh, as suggested, was really quite simple. Uh, my wife, a pathologist, and I suddenly realized one Sunday morning that this country had no major award recognizing outstanding medical research by a female researcher. We then arranged with the advice of the inaugural president of the Academy, from whom you've heard today, Ian Fraser, to establish the award in perpetuity. And then with wise uh, input from the council, the conditions and the mode of selection were agreed. And a critical element was that the award was to recognize one or more seminal discoveries in medical research. So this year, a committee of distinguished researchers from around the country undertook the difficult task of making the first selection. In addition, there was a small issue of having a medal designed and struck by the Royal Australian Mint. Uh, I provided a number of suggestions here, wearing a completely uh, different hat as a sculptor. Now, as we've already heard, I would like everyone to remain aware that the Academy continues to try to be proactive on lots of issues of diversity and inclusivity. This year, two thirds of the new fellows are women. The Academy is now made up of 30% of women, and this is an increasing number each year. And that's due to changes that have been introduced to the nomination and also the actual election procedures. Further, as has been stated earlier and during the day, in submissions to government, this academy has taken a strong view on these issues related to diversity. So for everyone in the academy, it gives us all great pleasure to recognize the outstanding seminal discoveries made by our inaugural winner of the medal. The winner is Professor Georgina Long from the Melanoma Institute Australia in Sydney, where she's the co-medical director. Melanoma is Australia's cancer. We have the highest incidence of melanoma in the world. Less than a decade ago, advanced melanoma was a certain death sentence. I've known about melanoma since I was a little girl because my parents were very much aware of all public health issues. And one thing my mother always said was, try and make a difference to many. I am so proud of the work that I have done with the team here at Melanoma Institute Australia, impacting so many facets of melanoma. We have worked with immunotherapies that are successfully curing patients, targeted therapies which are extending survival and curing even more, working with diagnostics to quickly assess the prognosis of patients producing incredible, highly cited, important papers. And the team at Melanoma Institute Australia have also been working in the prevention of melanoma. For example, banning of sunbeds across Australia and many other parts of the world. Receiving this award is most humbling and a huge honor, particularly when I look around and see the women in science and the work they're doing. I hope that I can be a role model for women who come after me. Melanoma has been the poster child for cancer research and immunotherapies in cancer. 
it's so exciting to see all the leaps and bounds forwards in terms of the survival and management of melanoma, but even more exciting to see that we've impacted so many other cancers as well. The future looks bright. I truly believe we will get to zero deaths from melanoma with the trajectory we're following. Congratulations from us all on your award. What an exciting set of achievements that all Australians especially should be grateful for. A couple of quick questions from me. Uh, the second one's shorter than the first one. I can remember as a preclinical medical student in Sydney, we weren't allowed to see any patients in pajamas until about year four. However, my father was a physician at Prince Henry Hospital and not infrequently he'd take me down to see patients on a Saturday morning. And one time he dropped me off in the neurology ward with a neurologist on duty, took me to see two patients that I had to work out. One was a stroke victim who was completely aphasic. This was a challenge. And the second person also was a challenge. She was a person in a coma. This lady was about 25 years old and I actually knew her, but I'd not seen her for about a year. She was dying from cerebral metastases from a malignant melanoma. So I think my question revolves around how much do we know about the epidemiology of this and the benefits of treatment for melanoma arising in people of completely different ages from the youngsters right up to the middle and elderly? Oh, that's a wonderful question, Simon, and something we're actually working on. We recently published uh, on young adults with melanoma. And it seems that there is a genetic predisposition that's not necessarily inherited that may make the combination of UV, sun exposure, uh, and some genetic predisposition that gives rise to melanoma in our young people. Interestingly, uh, melanoma is Australia's cancer. We have the highest incidence in the world and it disproportionately impacts our young people. So this is an excellent question. But interestingly, uh, young people still have that UV signature in their melanoma. So it is still uh, an impactful a cause for melanoma in these young people. But the good news is that uh, that woman you described, 25 year old with cerebral metastases, we actually are giving long-term durable control. As medical oncologists, I'm a medical oncologist, we don't like to use the word cure, but, but cure in a sense uh, to more than 50% of people like her with cerebral metastases. And that first trial to demonstrate that was an Australian trial that we led and I'm so proud of uh, in being in this country, being able to do this important work and the impact it's had on other, other cancers. Thank you for that. That's a, a wonderful description and summary of, of some of your work. Uh, look, a final brief question. How do you see the, the award of the medal helping in the push to ensure that women medical researchers are overtly recognised and rewarded for their work? And what will you do to help this push? Uh, another excellent uh, question. And I think as uh, a female who's grown up in Australia, and really as a child struggled to see many women in leadership positions. Uh, uh, this is one opportunity for all of us women to pave that pathway to equal opportunities for leadership, for research, for grants, for publications. We still see uh, the subconscious bias is there creating barriers for us. And the more visible women are for both men and women, uh, it is only a good thing and it only adds to solving scientific issues and problems and research even more. And I would like to um, just highlight a few key role models in my own life um, that have helped me and I hope that I and the women who come after me can do that for all researchers and particularly women. Uh, my mother juggled six children, a career in public health, and I saw the difficulties she had as a woman uh, and I watched her struggle. Uh, Richard Scolia, who is a wonderful role model, friend, supporter, uh, a mentor who now I co-lead 
Melanoma Institute Australia, uh, people like Robin Ward, current Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health, a courageous leader uh, when higher education universities are facing threats not faced before, our own president, uh, Ingrid Sheffer. These are all people around us who can uh, make things possible, help pave that, that road, help break down, get around hurdles and to just, just decimate unconscious bias. Uh, we need diversity in every shape and form and we will only be better as a community for it. Um, I have so many other people who have um, given us, given, given me that path. Anne Sefton, uh, who was Associate Dean at Sydney University, my chemistry teacher, uh, Rick Kefford taught me to say yes, even though uh, I had not seen that around me. Women would hold back and say, oh, will I fit this in? He said, say yes, do it, worry about the rest later. So these are all people who have helped mould me and I hope that I can um, help others achieve their very best and solve scientific problems together. Thank you, congratulations again, and we look forward to more progress from you on both fronts. Thank you. I'm honoured and humbled. Thank you. Thanks, Simon and Georgina. Some really important points raised there, and uh, it's important to cast light on these many issues for women. And my congratulations, Georgina, on being our inaugural medalist for the Academy Medal for Outstanding Female researcher very richly deserved. Thank you. So um, I'd like to now encourage the fellowship that nominations for our medals for 2022 are now open as of tomorrow. And I'd encourage you to nominate candidates. Information is available on the Academy's website, aahms.org. Nominations for the Outstanding Female Researcher Medal close on 27 February 2022 and for the Junzo Medal on 30 April 2022. Once again, I'd like to warmly congratulate all of the winners tonight. I think we've heard about absolutely stellar scientists and medical researchers in Australia, and I think it just shows how well Australia is doing. Our thanks again to CSL for their partnership this evening and their support for our annual meeting. I also want to acknowledge the wonderful support from Belbury Limited for our annual meeting. And I thank you, the viewers, for joining and supporting us in acknowledging our fantastic recipients. I hope to see you tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, AEDT for the Academy's second day of our annual meeting. Good night. <laughs>